In this video, we're going to talk about global water supply and global water use. Sometimes people call the Earth a water planet, and there's good reason for that with all of our oceans. But water is not evenly distributed across this planet. Two of the most amazing things I've seen in my life are the Amazon forest from an airplane, where you fly for two hours over this green forest that just does not stop, with massive rain clouds everywhere. And another experience, flying over the Sahara, um, where it's just brown desert with no vegetation, again, for hours from an airplane. The world is a, a study of contrast when it comes to water, and the future of our water use on this planet is one of um, areas where there's plenty of water and areas where there's great scarcity, and that's one of the key things that we're going to have to wrestle with as we look toward the 21st century. In this video, we're going to take a look at how global water use has changed over time in relation to the growth of the human population. And we'll ask specifically the question of whether or not per capita water use is going up or going down. We're then going to compare and contrast the major uses of water in the context of whether they're consumptive or non-consumptive. Those are definitions that we'll talk about a little bit later in the video. Lastly, we're going to look at global patterns in water availability and consider how water use and demand may change in the future as a function of these patterns in distribution and availability. We're going to start off by asking this question of whether global water use is going up at a faster rate than the rate of growth in the human population. The answer to this question matters a lot because we know the supply of fresh water is finite on this planet and understanding whether or not water use is going up faster than human population tells us whether or not we're using more water per person or less water per person um, each year. So to be able to answer this question, I made a graph using data from the UN Population Division and the World Bank. Um, the two y-axes here have more, they have the same relative scale, 0 to 8. In this case, it's 8,000 billion meters cubed of water, or 8 billion people on, on the planet on the right y-axis. Um, since those are on the same scale, we can actually look at the slopes, which look a pretty similar up to about 1980, and then the slope changes after that for water use, and it actually looks like we're um, not increasing water use as fast as we're increasing population. Now, I want to make a point here, actually, and show you this version of the figure, where I monkeyed around with the uh, y-axis on the left to make it look like water use is actually going up at a faster rate than population. So if you read a graph like this, to answer a question like this, be careful that you're paying attention to what the axis values are. All right, so this data set's a little limited. It only goes to 2014, and there's a break between 2010 and 2014. But what it looks like is that, uh, in fact, population is going up faster than water use. A better way to answer this question about water use is to calculate a per capita water use, or a per person water use number. And so when we do that by dividing total water use by the human population, we see this graph. And what it shows us is that from 1950 to 1980, per capita water use actually went up quite a lot, meaning every person on average was using more water each year. But from 1980 to 2014, it's dropped quite a bit. So right now, the average person on the planet uses about 550 cubic meters, about the quarter of the volume of an Olympic-sized swimming pool each year. Um, so per capita water use is declining, but total water use is still going up because the human population is growing. As is the case with almost everything in environmental science, global averages don't tell you a whole lot about how the world actually works. So if we look at water withdrawals per capita here for 2015 data, we see a lot of variation across the world, um, with the U.S. in fact being one of the higher per capita users of water. Um, it's interesting actually here because the patterns are not the same as you would typically see for something like energy or some of the other metrics of consumption um, of goods or, or other um, products. We'll talk about why that is in a minute, but before we do that, we need to talk about two major types of water use and how they're different. The first major type of water use is consumptive water use, and that's the use of water that does not return the water to its source or when the quality is degraded to the degree that it can no longer serve as a usable resource. If I use water for mining and it gets contaminated and it has to be stored in a pond and can't be reused again, that's consumptive water use. We'll talk about another example in a minute. Non-consumptive water use actually returns the water to surface water supplies at or near the site of use. So when you flush a toilet and the water flows to a water treatment plant and then out into a river on the other side of your town, you're talking about non-consumptive water use. 
So we'll look at three major categories of water use now and how use rates vary around the world. Those are going to be industrial, agricultural, and municipal water use. We'll start with industrial water use. Um, industrial water use includes many different activities, things like paper production, fossil fuel exploration, where water is injected down into subsurface environments to try to um, increase the production of uh, fossil resource. Air, uh, it's used in mining for um, cleaning rock or extracting materials, all sorts of different purposes. Globally, industrial water use scales with the overall level of industrial activity. So you see high rates of industrial water use in places like the U.S. and China that have a lot of industry. Um, and a large part of industrial water use is consumptive, um, either because the water cannot be recovered um, or it becomes contaminated in use and can't be used again. I want on you to note the scale on all these graphs. So the national level use here goes up to about 320 billion cubic meters. Um, so you can compare that to the other sources as we go through. Now let's look at agricultural water withdrawals. And let's just cut to the main point of the slide here, which is that agricultural water use is a dominant use of water globally. The primary use of water in agriculture is the irrigation of crops. Um, we use both groundwater and surface water for that. And virtually all irrigation is consumptive. And that's because crops take water up out of the soil and they release it in the atmosphere through their leaves. And that water's not destroyed. It goes from liquid water in the soil to atmospheric water vapor. But that atmospheric water vapor then leaves the region and it blows out over an ocean or it travels to another continent. The long story short, it's lost from the side of the region, so it's consumed and no longer available. If you look at the scale on this graph, remember the last one went up to about 380 billion cubic meters of water. This one goes up to about 700 billion meters cubed of water. We use a lot, a lot of water in agriculture globally. Our last category is municipal water withdrawal. Um, this is what you actually use each day in your household and what is used in cities for other purposes. Inside your house, the use of water is mostly non-consumptive because the water is returned to rivers. So when you wash water down a sink or through a toilet, it ends up in a water treatment facility and then it ends up in a river. It's not, not consumed. Um, outside the house, when you irrigate a landscape, water your lawn, that's consumptive water use because it's functionally the same as what happens in agriculture. The U.S. overall has been really, really high for municipal water use, um, but there have been huge changes in the U.S. in recent years that we'll look at in a separate video. So if we go to the scale here, total use, national use is at 80 billion cubic meters compared to the 380 for industrial or the over 800 billion cubic meters that are used in agriculture. So this is our smallest use out of all of these. Somewhere on the order of 10 to 20 percent of water use in the United States, for example, is municipal versus almost half is agricultural. So we just talked about how we use water. Now we're going to talk about where the water exists on the planet. And the big picture here is that water is really unevenly distributed. If you look at South America versus Northern Africa, there's a massive difference in per capita available freshwater water resources. Um, almost 30,000 or over 30,000 cubic meters of water on average per person in South America is available versus 256 cubic meters um, per capita in Northern Africa. So keep in mind that the global per capita water use rate is about 550 cubic meters per year. So if we're asking like how much water does somebody actually have access to each year, um, we've got this enormous range. Now the U.S. is about 8,800 um, cubic meters per person per year. Uh, so up there on the higher end, but as we'll look at in a second, the U.S. is really unevenly distributed, even within the country. So big points here. Some regions really have a lot of water and a lot of room for growth in the use of fresh water. Other regions do not. Um, and in fact, some regions are very, very close to the limits of their additional use. And so that what that means is that any additional population growth or additional agriculture or industrial development is going to put a lot of pressure on freshwater resources, especially in places that don't have a lot. Now, the other thing to think about is that national statistics only tell you part of the story. And if you live in the United States, you know this very well. The parts of the U.S. that are really dry and parts that are much wetter. So this is a nice map. Um, it's made, actually updated very frequently at the website that's located in the lower right-hand corner here. It's a map of drought. And you can see that the entire southwestern U.S. 
at the moment, which is September 29th, 2020, is in extreme to exceptional drought. Many parts of California, Oregon, and Washington are also in drought, and that's a big part of the reason that there are forest fires um, raging through those regions right now. So while the U.S. has these estimated freshwater resources of 8,800 cubic meters per person, um, we don't actually have enough water in certain parts of the country, particularly in places like the Southwest. And the other problem with surface water is that it varies a lot from year to year. And we'll look at that in a, in a second, but some years are good, some years are bad. And so the average does, doesn't tell the whole story. In fact, it doesn't tell enough of the story to make solid, sustainable plans. So if we want to get a sense for actually how stressed countries are, basically how close they are to the limits of their freshwater withdrawals, this is a good way to look at it on this map. So countries like the United States are in the low to medium stress category, high stress in the southwest, low stress probably in the northeast. Uh, Mexico is in the medium and high stress, China's in medium to high stress. A big chunk of northern Africa is in extremely high stress, as we saw actually in some of those numbers a little bit ago. So in general, we're already seeing a lot of countries that have water limitation or stress, and it's going to get more severe in the future because populations are continuing to grow and climate change tends to make this problem worse. Climate change tends to intensify the ups and the downs of the hydrologic cycle. Um, more extreme events, more floods, more droughts, and it also tends to amplify some of the drought cycles in some of the continental areas, as we'll talk about later in a different video on climate change. But we can actually do something about this. We can reduce water stress by increasing water use efficiency, especially in agriculture. And that's actually part of the story for why per capita water use is going down. And we can change what we do with water, as I'll show you on the next slide. So imagine you were put in charge of one of these countries with moderate to severe water stress. And somebody said, well, how can we still grow food, produce food without using as much water? Well, the good news is that there's actually a lot of ways to make changes in the agricultural system to reduce water use. A big one is to use more water to grow crops than we use, instead of using that, those crops to support livestock. Beef, for example, takes 15,000 plus cubic meters of water to produce a ton of beef, whereas vegetables take about 300 cubic meters of water to produce a ton of food product. So, Putting our emphasis on growing um, vegetables and crops instead of livestock is one way to reduce water use. And actually, you can even adjust the types of livestock you grow to reduce water use if you're in a situation where you want to try to be more efficient with the use of water at the national level. These are things we'll talk more about in some of the agricultural videos. Wrapping all of this up then, we've seen that per capita water use increased up to about 1980 and then it has declined up to about 2014. So global water use is becoming more efficient, but total use is still rising because population is going up. If we look across the different sort of use sectors for water, we see that agriculture is the biggest use of water, followed by industry, followed by municipal uses. And the other thing with agriculture and industry is that a lot of that use is consumptive, whereas a lot of municipal use is less consumptive and therefore less impactful on freshwater supplies. Lastly, we've seen that water is really unevenly distributed around the world. Some regions are in really good shape. Other regions are in much worse shape. And year-to-year -year variations in water supply are really important, and they often matter as much or more than average availability. So when we get to talking about climate, this is definitely something we'll come back to.